Welcome to yet another video of this series. Apologies for not showing up for 5 months. We learnt in the last video about the photoelectric experiments and saw the deviation of the experimental results from the classical waves theory. We discussed Einstein's quantum theory of photoelectric effect as well and saw how Einstein's photon hypothesis explains the deviations of the experimental results from the classical waves theory. We plan to discuss matter waves in this video but later decided to take up the mathematics of quantum mechanics in greater detail. This will help us to understand Schrodinger's wave equation, potential well problem, tunneling, the hydrogen atom, and later other aspects of semiconductor physics in much greater detail. As we have seen in the previous discussions too, semiconductor physics defies common logic. And from this video, we get into greater detail on how so. We begin our discussion with a simple experiment which we will use to measure one component of the intrinsic spin angular momentum of an atom. This experiment was originally carried out by O. Stern and W. Gerlach in 1922 using a beam of silver atoms. We call this measurement apparatus as a stern gerlach device. This video will lay the conceptual foundations needed to understand the experiment and in the next video we will see the actual experiment. To understand the stern gerlach experiment we will need to derive the relationship between the intrinsic spin angular momentum of a particle and its magnetic moment and then discuss the effect an inhomogeneous magnetic field has on a magnetic dipole. Consider a point particle of charge Q mass m in a circular orbit of radius r with speed v. The orbital angular momentum l is given by r into m into v. m into v is the momentum here. Hence l becomes r into p. p stands for the momentum. Now the magnetic moment of the particle is mu which is equal to i into a by c where c is the velocity of light. c is needed here as we are using Gaussian units. If we were calculating in SI units we would not be needing c and mu is a vector quantity here where i equals to q by t where t is the time period of the revolution. Now t the time period is equal to 2 pi r by v which is the linear velocity of the particle. The area a formed by the orbit of radius r is pi r squared as we all know. Now substituting the values of l, t and a and expressing the magnetic moment in terms of the angular momentum we get mu equals to i which is the current due to the rotating charge into A by C which makes I Q into V by 2 pi R and A to be pi R squared divided by C. After simplifying the expression becomes mu equals to Q into V into R by 2 C. Now we have to bring in L into the expression of course since we are deriving the relationship between mu and the magnetic moment and intrinsic spin angular momentum. So since L is m into v into r, we finally get the relation mu equal to q into L by 2 into m into c. q by 2 mc is a proportionality constant in this case. The relation is generally true if the mass and charge coincide in space. So now we know that if a charged particle of some mass spins in some orientation, it exhibits characteristics of a magnetic dipole. Now by modifying the charge and mass distributions independently, we can obtain different constants of proportionality as we shall see now. If we reorganize the charge and mass distributions, we can obtain different constants of proportionality. For instance, if we assume a solid sphere of mass m and radius r with charge q uniformly distributed over its surface, we get this. 
Now let's give it a spin with velocity v on its axis. To get a proportionality constant of 5q by 6mc, So we can replace the spinning sphere now with a magnetic dipole and depending on the axis of the spin, we can safely assume that the magnet also orients itself accordingly. When we talk about the intrinsic spin angular momentum of a particle, the relationship becomes mu equal to g q by 2 mc into s. S is used instead of L in this case. G here is a dimensionless factor and it's 2 for an electron, 5.58 for a proton and minus 3.82 for a neutron. We may be tempted to think that G is telling us about how the charge and mass are distributed for the different particles and that intrinsic spin angular momentum is just orbital angular momentum of the particle itself as it spins about its axis. We will see going forward such a simple classical picture of intrinsic spin does not account for many peculiarities in the quantum world. The intrinsic spin angular momentum we are discussing which we explained classically in reality is very different. In fact it appears that even a point particle in quantum mechanics may have intrinsic spin angular momentum which we cannot explain classically. If we are to assume classically that a point mass is to generate an angular momentum, it would have to spin at speeds many times more than the speed of light. Let us now discuss the interaction of a magnetic dipole with an inhomogeneous magnetic field. Specifically, we will calculate the force exerted on the dipole in one direction. Though in the diagram, the magnetic dipole is shown outside the field, let us imagine that it sits within the inhomogeneous field making an angle of theta with the magnetic field beta. The energy of a magnetic dipole within any magnetic field, homogeneous and inhomogeneous, is given by minus mu dot b or the dot product between mu and b. Since we are only examining one component of mu along the z axis, we have mu z equals mu cos theta. The force exerted then on the dipole due to the inhomogeneous magnetic field is F equals to del mu dot b. We are calculating the gradient here. Let's not worry where the minus sign went here for now. Now as the inhomogeneous magnetic field is in the z direction here, we get Fz equals to mu db by dz or Fz equals to mu z dbz by dz. The force is non-zero because dbz by dz is non-zero, meaning as we move along the z-axis, the value of b changes. Had it been a homogeneous field, b would be constant if we moved along the z-axis, due to which db by dz equals to zero and thus Fz equals to zero in a homogeneous magnetic field. Now let us see how the force on the magnetic dipole varies as the angle of the magnetic dipole changes from 0 degrees to 180 degrees. At theta of 0 degrees, we see that mu is equal to mu z as mu cos 0 is 1. So the maximum force in the z direction is exerted. At theta between 0 and 90 degrees, the force exerted is less as mu z is lesser but the force is still in the upwards direction. At 90 degrees, the magnetic dipole does not exert any force in the z direction as cos 90 is zero. When the magnet makes an angle greater than 90 degrees and less than 180 degrees, we see that a force is exerted on the dipole but in the opposite direction and at an angle of 180 degrees. The force is the same as 0 degrees but in the opposite direction that is downwards. So assuming we throw some dipoles in, in this magnetic field oriented at various angles, depending on the force exerted on the dipoles as we just saw, the dipoles will be deflected upwards, downwards with different displacement 
and some will not be displaced at all. Let us remember this for our next video. In our next video, we will use what we learned here to explain the findings from the stern gerlach experiments and in the process discover the quirkiness of quantum physics. See you in the next video.